rejected the commandment of God to believe God, to keep their own tradition. Their own tradition is works of the law, righteousness which is of the law. So, uh, God says in verse 18, even though that's what's happened to, remember the question, remember the goal of all this, going back to Romans 10, 1, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. Israel is of no excuse, according to verse 18, because they've heard the gospel, uh, the, cre the everlasting gospel. They know from their conscience that they are sinners, and that they know that uh, that Jesus, uh, that, that God is the Creator, and so based upon that evidence, they know He has the eternal power to give them life. So they know, even though they haven't been given a clear gospel for, like Deuteronomy 30 preaches, and they haven't used the oracles of God to their advantage because the, patters, the pastors have destroyed and scattered the sheep, they still know that they're sinners and that God has the power to save them based upon that everlasting gospel. Well, God then, remember, again, the pastors or the religious leaders were evil. So, and they led them astray. They didn't hear the oracles of God. They had to rely upon the everlasting gospel. So then when you get to verse 19, and he says, But I say, did not Israel know? Now what he's going to say is, Okay, they knew from the everlasting gospel, that God is the creator, and they knew from the law of the conscience that they're sinners. But the religious leaders led them astray. So now what, what Paul is going into is for these last three verses here in Romans 10, as he's saying that because of the religious leaders leading you astray, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to replace those people. And I'm going to lead Israel. In other words, Israel knew by the everlasting gospel that they needed to believe God, but they still didn't do it. And God's desire, just like Paul's desire, is for Israel to be saved. So since the everlasting gospel didn't work for them, then God needs to bring a further gospel. He needs to bring the gospel that's in the Old Testament for them to uh, recognize their sin and trust in God to save them through the word that's given unto them, which was that Mosaic law that recognizes that they're sinners, that they cannot be saved through their performance of the law, uh, and that they recognize their sin through the animal sacrifices and doing all those things, and that Mosaic law then can be that extra teacher so that they believe the gospel and be saved so that because the everlasting gospel or the creation gospel wasn't enough to save them. So God has to bring a second gospel. Same thing for us in the dispensation of grace. Tower of Babel. We had the creation gospel. We didn't believe it. So the Gentiles are saved now by Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. That's how we're saved. So we get salvation through this gospel given in the dispensation of grace. Israel, they were under the Mosaic law. They didn't hear it, so they were under the everlasting gospel. They still didn't believe. So then when you get to the ad hand phase of the kingdom, after the rapture, they are to repent and be water baptized. So now they've got a gospel for them, for Israel to be saved. And that's what he's getting at now. He says in verse 19, But I say, did not Israel know... First, Moses saith, I will provoke you to jealousy by them that are no people, and by a foolish nation I will anger you. Okay, that foolish, what that, uh, the foolish nation there ends up being the believing remnant of Israel. Okay, let's, to understand that, go over to Deuteronomy 32. Uh, this, when he says Moses saith, it's a quote of Deuteronomy 32, 21. Interesting that that comes right after Deuteronomy 30. So because they did not understand Deuteronomy 30, then God is going to have to take further measures. And in Deuteronomy 32, Deuteronomy 32, verse 21. Right, let's look at verse 20. Deuteronomy 32, verse 20. And he said, God said, I will hide my face from them, hide my face from Israel, and I will see what their end shall be. So why is God not saving Israel? For they are a very froward or perverse generation, children in whom is no faith. No faith. They didn't believe God and His Word. So how am I going to get no faith children to be faithful children? He says in verse 21, They have moved me to jealousy with that which is not God. 
They have provoked me to anger with their vanities, and I will move them to jealousy with those which are not a people. I will provoke them to anger with a foolish nation. Okay, so that's what he quotes there in Romans 10, 19. Now, the way we know that that's talking about the believing remnant of Israel is now we look at Matthew 21 and Luke 12. Matthew 21 and Luke 12. Matthew 21 and Luke 12. In Matthew 21, Matthew 21, Jesus talking to those religious leaders. Deuteronomy, I'm sorry, Matthew 21, 42. Matthew 21, 42. Jesus saith unto them, Did ye never read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected, the same as become the head of the corner? This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore say I unto you, because you've rejected the Messiah, you crucified him, you rejected him, therefore say I unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. Well, that's the foolish nation prophesied in Deuteronomy 32, 21. So the kingdom of God taken away from the religious leaders because they did not present the gospel of recognizing that they are sinners under the law and trusting in God to save them and at the at-hand phase of the kingdom getting water baptized. They didn't do that. So God says, I've got to replace you leaders and I'm going to replace you with a nation bringing forth the fruits thereof. Now you look at Luke 12. Look at Luke 12, verse 31. Luke 12, 31. This is Jesus talking to the disciples. Luke 12, 31. But rather, seek ye the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. Fear not, little flock. That's the believing remnant of Israel. Fear not, little flock. For it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. So, when Paul says in Romans 10, 19, that I will provoke you to jealousy by them that are no people, and by a foolish nation I will anger you, that ends up being the believing remnant of Israel based upon Matthew 21, 43, and Luke 12, 32. So, what Paul is saying, basically, in Romans 10, God had committed the oracles of God to Israel. They were favored by God, just like us today. We know Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection as atonement for our sin. Israel knew they had the Mosaic Law to teach them, and they could have trusted in God to save them, because that Mosaic Law would have pointed them to uh, needing a savior rather than them obeying the law themselves to be saved. But because the religious leaders didn't preach that, they destroyed and scattered the people, Israel had to rely upon the everlasting gospel, Romans 10, 18 says. So then God says, I'm going to correct that situation. I'm still going to get Israel saved. Israel is in the same status as the Gentiles were under the Tower of Babel, because all they know is creation, and they haven't believed in that. So now I'm going to replace the leaders of the nation of Israel with the believing remnant of Israel. That's what he says in verse 19. So that's what he does in the first part of Acts. In Acts chapter 2, the Holy Ghost comes down on the day of Pentecost, and now the little flock are the new leaders. The kingdom of God is taken away from the Pharisees, it's given to the believing remnant of Israel. And they are going about preaching, repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, Acts 2.38. So they preach the gospel of the kingdom to Israel. Pharisees failed to do that. Now the little flock is doing it. But then you get to Acts 7 and you have the stoning of Stephen. So then God has to take a further step because in spite of the fact that God changed the leadership from the Pharisees to the believing remnant or the little flock, Israel still yielded to the religious leaders. Even though God says, I've taken the kingdom of God from the Pharisees, I've given it to the little flock, then I give the little flock the Holy Ghost and they preach the gospel. Even so, Israel didn't believe them. They believed their religious leaders, much like today. You, according to 2 Corinthians 5, are ambassadors for Christ. You are charged with giving the gospel to people so that they may believe. And yet you may go out and preach it, or at least 
show it through Christ's love coming through you to others, and they still won't believe because of the hardness of their hearts. And they trust in churchianity. If they're looking for the answers, they don't go to you even though you've got the gospel. They go to people preaching a false gospel, churchianity. Well, that's what happened in Israel. God takes away the leadership from the Pharisees, gives it to the believing remnant of Israel. They're preaching a clear, true gospel. And yet Israel doesn't look to them. They look to churchianity. They look to their Jewish religious leaders still. So then God says, so then God says, okay, first, remember, they heard the creation gospel in verse 18, but they still didn't believe. And they didn't hear the gospel of the kingdom because their leaders scattered my sheep. So then what I did was I took away their leaders. I replaced them with the little flock of Israel in Acts chapter 2. And now I'm having them preach the clear gospel. But then the problem is, they're preaching the clear gospel, but they still, just like today, the people as a whole look to the Jewish religious leaders still, because they walk by sight and not by faith. So even though God gave them those leaders, they still didn't go to them. They went to the Jewish religious leaders instead of going to the little flock. So then God says, okay, now I've got to take a step further. So then God starts the dispensation of grace. Starts the dispensation of grace with Paul in Acts chapter 9. And so then he starts having, um, so then we start, you know, the new dispensation, preaching the gospel of grace, the mystery gospel, mystery doctrine. That's what verse 20 is talking about. Romans 10, 20 says, but Isaiah is very bold. So Moses is pretty bold in saying God's going to replace the religious leaders in Israel. Isaiah is very bold by saying he's going to set aside that whole nation. He quotes Isaiah 65, 1 through 2. And of course, if you read Isaiah 65 before the mystery was revealed, you would not understand this. This is only by Jesus Christ through the progressive revelation given to Paul that we understand that Isaiah 65, 1 through 2 is talking about the dispensation of grace. So he says, But Isaiah is very bold and saith, I was found of them that sought me not, I was made manifest unto them that asked not after me. So that's us, the body of Christ. Israel pursued righteousness from Jehovah God, but they did it by their own law. The Gentiles were often their pagan stuff. The Greeks and the Romans, they had all these gods and deities that they served. <coughs> they weren't trying to serve Jehovah God. But when the gospel is given by Paul to the Gentiles, then they believe it. And so Isaiah 65, 1 through 2 is fulfilled through the dispensation of grace. And then he says, uh, verse 21, But to Israel he saith, All day long have I stretched forth my hands unto a disobedient and gainsaying people. Now when we get to Romans 11 next week, it is going to show you, especially when we get to the olive tree, which would probably be two weeks from now. So we're going to take two weeks in Romans 11. Uh, when we get to that second week in the olive tree, you're going to see the whole plan of God, the master plan, laid out for you at the end of the chapter 11. That God re rejects the Gentiles in Genesis 11 with the Tower of Babel. God starts Israel's program in Genesis 12. God sets Israel aside in, um, in Acts chapter 7 at the Stone of Stephen. God starts the body of Christ in Romans chapter 9. I'm sorry, Acts chapter 9. Acts chapter 9, he starts the body of Christ with Paul there and the dispensation of grace. Then when we are raptured up, and then God starts Israel's program again. And the reason he has to do it that way is that's how Israel is saved. In Romans 11, 25, Romans 11, 25 says, I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in, and so all Israel shall be saved. As it is written, there shall come out of Zion the Deliverer and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. The only way from Israel to be saved is the Gentiles have to be saved first. So you go back to Romans 10, 18. Israel is given the law, but they don't hear it 
They only hear the everlasting gospel, the creation gospel, due to the pastors of Israel destroying and scattering the people. So then, verse 20, God replaces the leadership with the little flock or the believing remnant of Israel. Israel still will not listen. They still go to the Pharisees. So then, verse 20, God sets aside the nation of Israel, starts the dispensation of grace with the Apostle Paul, and the Gentiles are saved. And then, still to Israel, he saith, All day long have I stretched forth my hands unto a disobedient and gainsaying people. And it's not until the rapture of the church that Israel is saved. And we'll go into that two weeks from now. But right now, I'll tell you what it is. In the book of Matthew, if you remember Jesus, the Pharisees asked him, Show us a sign, and we will believe. And Jesus says, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign. The only sign that will be given them is of the prophet Jonas. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the belly of the well, so shall also the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Basically, what he's saying there is that the sign that an evil and adulterous generation is given is resurrection. Three days and three nights in the earth, then Jonah was resurrected when he, the fish spit him out. Jesus is resurrected when he comes from the dead. 1 Corinthians 15 says that Christ is the first fruits of the resurrection. Who's next? After them, it's the body of Christ. When the rapture takes place, we will be resurrected from the dead. 1 Corinthians 1.22 says the Jews require a sign and the Greeks seek after wisdom. So the sign that is, that is given to the Jews so that they believe is the resurrected Christ from the dead, as he said in Matthew. But ultimately that is fulfilled in the church, the body of Christ. Christ rose from the dead, they still didn't believe. But when we rise from the dead, the body of Christ, once the Gentiles, the fullness of the Gentiles be come in, then Israel will be saved. So God gives the law to Israel, gives, starts Israel's program, their leaders reject it, so all they have is the creation gospel. God replaces the leadership with the little flock. Israel still wouldn't believe. So then God sets aside the nation of Israel, starts the dispensation of grace. They still don't believe in the dispensation of grace. But then once we are resurrected, then they see the sign of Three days and three nights, they see the Son of Man coming up in the body of Christ being raised from the dead with the Gentiles at the rapture. And the result is Israel finally believes. Dear Lord, we just thank you for giving us your word. And although we covered a very difficult passage today, I pray that the Holy Spirit has given us understanding and light in it, that we will believe what you and your word say rather than what churchianity says. That we will recognize the righteousness which is of faith is what you that you are pleased with not in our performance in any way. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen.